uh, the Parsha of Matan Torah, the Ten Commandments. Uh, this was the very purpose of the Exodus. Remember, if you go back a few weeks ago, Hashem used four terms of redemption when he described the Exodus. V'hotseisi, I will take you out. V'hitzalti, I will save you. V'ga'alti, I will redeem you. V'lakachti eschem liliam, I will take you unto me for a nation. And you'll recall that the reason why we have four cups of wine at the Seder is to correspond to those four terms of redemption. But what's interesting is, and you might not notice this, the fourth term of redemption, I will take you unto me for a nation, is not a reference to the Exodus at all. It's a reference to, I'll give you the Torah that will make you my nation. Which means, in other words, Matan Torah is not just an event. Matan Torah is part of the redemption from Mitzrayim. Yitzias Mitzrayim was not finished until we got the Torah. That's very important. In fact, the Ramban actually writes that, you know, we have a holiday of Pesach, which is freedom, and we have a holiday of Shavuos, which is Matan Torah, and we have a period called the Counting of the Omer that connects the holiday of freedom and the holiday of Torah. The Ramban actually says, one way of looking at it is, that Pesach and Shavuos are one long holiday, and the counting of the Omer is Chol HaMoed. Now, halachically, that's not so, but spiritually, it's that way. So if you tell your boss you don't work during Chol HaMoed, which you can do in Israel, you can say that, uh, and you don't show up for 49 days between Pesach and Shavuos, uh, you could say, hey, I took off Chol HaMoed, but the job will probably not be waiting for you under those circumstances. But what is the idea? that Pesach and Shavuos are one holiday and the counting of the Omer is like Chol HaMoed? Because freedom has value only when it's connected to Torah. Chazal make this point in a few ways. They point out that the grain offering that you bring during Pesach is barley. That's called the Omer offering. Barley, before the invention of Cholent, was animal food. Humans generally did not eat barley. On Shavuos, we bring a grain offering of wheat, which is human consumption. Pesach, without Torah, you're like a wild animal that's free. It is Shavuos that takes your freedom and gives you human dignity. It gives you purpose. It gives you a reason for your freedom. You know, People, you know, you ask a person, like, what's the purpose of my life? A person might say, well, the purpose of my life is to be free. But freedom is not a purpose. Freedom is an enabler, meaning if I'm not free, I'm not able to do a lot of things. So I need some freedom in my life to be able to do something or be something. But freedom alone does not define the meaning of a life. And that's why Pesach without Shavuos is meaningless. And that is why the fourth Lashon of Geula, the fourth term of redemption in, about Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim is indeed about Matan Torah. Right, Matan Torah. Now I remember, this is before you guys were born, when there used to be the old Soviet Union, the evil empire of Soviet Union. So uh, during the 1970s, uh, every synagogue in the United States, conservative, orthodox, reform, no matter what, had a sign about free Soviet Jews. People were agitating to get uh, the Jews out of, out of the Soviet Union. Many of them came to Israel. Many came to the United States. Most of them were not religious at all. This was not a religious issue. This was a human rights issue. And they always quote the verse in the Torah, let my people go, which is taken from Exodus. But in reality... Let my people go is not an accurate translation and it's an incomplete. What Moshe said to Paro was not let my people go, it's it sends my people out. Okay, that's maybe a minor difference. But it says, sends my people out, vayavduni, so they will serve me. They left out that word on the sign. They just said, let my people go. No, that wasn't the end of it. Let my people go or send my people go, uh, free, vayavduni so they will serve me. Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim was not an end in and of itself. 
Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim had a certain tachlis, a certain purpose, which is Matan Torah. You know, there's an Indian poet, <coughs> I'm not alive anymore, but a famous Indian poet <coughs> who won the Nobel Prize for Literature all the way back in the 1920s. His uh, last name was Tagori. The first name is a real long Indian name, Rab something, but uh, Tagori, T-A-G-O-R-E. And Tagari uh, did not write about Jews. I don't even know if he knew any Jews. But he had some very interesting reflections. And he once said, a human soul is like a violin string. Now imagine a violin string that's totally free, a loose string. I have a string on the table here. What music do you get out of a loose string? You get nothing at all. But when you tie it down and it's stretched taut, then it is able to express the beautiful music within. He says, human beings are the same way, he says. A human being thinks, oh, if I'm free, if I could do whatever I want, then all of my inner beauty is going to come out. It's not true. You need structure. You need discipline. You need to be submitted, submissive to something higher than yourself. Thank you. You see? And that is the idea of freedom and Torah. And or, or another way to put it, Eric Fromm, who happened to be Jewish, but he was not uh, religious. He was Sigmund Freud, who also happened to be Jewish, not religious. Uh, he was Sigmund Freud's Talmud Mubak. So Eric Fromm said that one of the mistakes that the Western world makes is we define freedom as freedom from something. I'm free from oppression. I'm free from tyranny. Freedom can't just be freedom from something. It has to be freedom towards something. What are you free to do? What are you free to be? What are you going to do with your freedom? What's the tachlis? What's the point? And you know, human beings, all human beings, and especially Jews, we're hardwired to seek meaning and purpose in life. And when we don't get that meaning and purpose, that generates a tremendous anxiety, a tremendous sadness. And you try to kill that sadness by alcohol, by drugs, by sex, by workaholism, which is also a kind of addiction in a way. Because you want to kill the pain. The pain of not having meaning and not having connection is very powerful. And it's no accident that the suicide rates tend to be higher in affluent countries than in poverty-stricken countries. <clears throat> because when you're running around looking for a piece of bread and you've got to spend the whole day to find some water, you don't have time to think about the meaning of life because, you know, you're involved. But precisely when the physical needs are taken care of, that's when the absence of meaning can hit you like a ton of bricks and in a very extreme situation can result in a person taking his own life or the lives of others, all these high school shootings all over the United States, or whatever it is. It comes from an emptiness inside. And that emptiness, sometimes we can distract ourselves. We sometimes can manage to forget about it. We can drown it in all sorts of things. But it comes to the surface very, very often. And this is why when we think about Pesach, we think about Shavuos. You cannot separate the two ideas. In this connection, although I'm getting ahead of Pesach, but again, since we're reading about Yisias Mitzrayim, so I can talk about Pesach themes, I think they're connected here. You know, there's an Ashkenazi custom that uh, after you eat, you know, you finish the Haggadah and you eat the matzah and the moror and uh, the sandwich of the matzah and the moror. So now you're ready to eat the meal. So the very first thing that is served is a hard-boiled egg. Now, it's not a chiv. It's not a chiv. People sometimes think, for some reason, some people elevate the egg more important than the matzah. Uh, the matzah is more important than the egg, that's for sure. But eating the egg is, a, is, a, is a, an old custom, an old Ashkenazi custom, that we start the meal with a hard-boiled egg. And one of the reasons that's given is that the first day of Pesach is always the same day of the week as Tisha B'Av, later in the summer. So if the first Seder, or, and I would just say the only Seder, is, um, 
is, let's say, Sunday night, Monday. So Tisha B'Av will be Sunday night, Monday. And therefore, at our Seder, we remember the Beis HaMikdash. And giving a person an egg, an egg is a mourner's food because it's oval or circular and it reminds a person that the bad times will have good times. So the same way you give an egg to a mourner after a funeral. So at the Seder, we observe mourning by eating the egg because it's connected to Tisha B'Av. Now, Lachari, you might ask the question, there are no coincidences in Jewish life. Why would it be so that God caused the temple to be destroyed, the ninth of Av, the same day of the week as our liberation from Mitzrayim? <coughs> Why would that be so? So I would suggest, this is just a speculation, if you ask me for the source, uh, there is no source, it's just uh, my own thought, but I, I think it may be true, perhaps, and that is <coughs> the first day of Pesach is the only day of Pesach that's not yet connected to Shavuos, because we don't start counting the Omer till the second day of Pesach. Why that's so is another question. But the first day, we don't yet have the connection to Torah. So the first day is freedom without Torah. So maybe the lesson is, when your freedom is not connected to Torah, it'll lead to Tisha B'av. it'll lead to destruction. See, only when freedom is connected to Torah does it become something positive. So in a sense, the egg is the substitute for the counting of the Omer. Right? The counting of the Omer links Pesach to Shavuos. The egg reminds me when Pesach is not linked to Shavuos, freedom becomes very destructive. So that's one explanation for the egg. I'll give you another explanation as well. You know, an egg is uh, very unusual. The way birds hatch their young, they give birth to their young in two stages. The egg is laid, and then the egg is hatched. A two-stage birth, unlike mammals that are just born alive, uh, with birds, the egg, and then it comes out of the egg. So too, the remez is, the Jewish people were born in two stages. We have a two-stage birth. Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim was the laying of an egg. Shavuos is the hatching of the egg, in other words, so to speak, meaning we're, we're, we really were not born as a people until we got the Torah. Right? Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim was stage one. We talk a need to have a stage, a stage two. Right? So this is the idea of Torah. And people look at it as a paradox a little bit. You know, Chazal say in Pirkei Avos, Ein ben choren el amish osek betorah. The only person who is free is a person who learns the Torah and keeps the Torah. That's called freedom. Now you might say, well, why is that called freedom? That's called slavery. That makes me, you know, I can't do what I want, etc. I'm bound by this and by that and by that and by that. Why is that called freedom? So I want to share with you a thought that um, our Rosh Hashiva, Rav Schiller, he, she should be well, in good health, uh, would often say, you know, Judaism believes in free will, right? That's a very important idea, that, you know, you're free will. God does not predetermine if you're going to be righteous or not, right? Free will, bechira. So you ask a person, well, what does free will mean? So a person would normally say, well, free will means I can decide to do what I want. So Rabbi Schiller said, no. The true essence of free will is I can decide to do what I don't want to do. Meaning to say, if I simply do what I want... An animal does what it wants. Bechira, the koach of Bechira is, I can decide not to do what I want to do, or I can decide to do what I don't want to do. Meaning, Bechira is the override of my natural inclination in order to achieve a greater good. It's not doing what I want to do. It's doing what I don't want to do, right? Sometimes a person says, oh, I can't learn Torah. It doesn't excite me. Well, you know, that is sad. Somebody went to the Chavit Chaim and said, I have a problem. I don't have enthusiasm when I learn. So the Chavit Chaim says, so I guess you have to learn without enthusiasm for a while. No, for a while. It shouldn't be, you know, your lifelong thing. But part of being mature, I mean, this is, this is even outside of Yiddishkeit. 
you know, I don't want to go to work every day. I mean, life is about doing what you're supposed to do. In fact, they have a nice, that nice poster. It's still up, those uh, 10 things, you know, be on time, whatever. It's, all, all, it's like a secular poster, but they have like 10 steps uh, for how to live, you know. Or Jordan Peterson, had, uh, the, right, uh, Jordan Peterson's thing about uh, 12, was it 12 rules? You know, you know, those types of things. There's a famous experiment in social science, a very, very famous experiment where uh, they had a bunch of kids, and they offered the kids candy. And they said, um, or marshmallow or something, and they said, if you want it now, I'll give you one. If you wait 10 minutes, I'll give you two. So some kids wanted the one right now, and some of the kids waited 10 minutes, and they got the two. And they followed these kids over many years till they reached adulthood. And they discovered that the kids who were willing to wait, 10 minutes only, they turned out to be much more successful in life because they had the capacity to delay their gratification for a long-term goal. Now, long-term is 10 minutes. We're not talking about a real long-term goal. But even that was a predictor. The notion that you don't just live in the moment for whatever is best right now, but you understand that sometimes you sacrifice things for something better in the future. That's what spiritual life often is, right? You kind of say, well, listen, I'm not going to just give in. Right now, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do that. Rather, you defer immediate gratification uh, for something that's more meaningful, right? And that's a great, great predictor. So even in a secular context, those things are important. And that is certainly what the, what the life of a Jew is, is all about. Um, now, again, I, I don't mean to say that spiritual life should be joyless. Obviously, we, we should try to create lives of enthusiasm, lives of joy, etc. But it does mean that you can't expect these highs every moment. Right? There are going to be highs and lows. There are going to be dry periods and more fertile periods. And just like a surfer has to ride the waves, we all have to learn how to ride the waves. Right? People who expect that they need to be perpetually uh, inspired or perpetually entertained. And I, I have this sometimes, you walk into a share sometimes, and like, you know, some, so they're sitting, they, they want me to entertain them, or not just me, you know, any, you know, if they don't get entertained in the first minute, sometimes they don't give you, then they walk out. You know, again, these are things that rabbis experience sometimes. But the point is, not every word is supposed to be, you know, some massive entertainment. And uh, all of us have to learn that there are going to be ups and downs, and we got to stick with it. Stick with the plan, and be as Ratz Hashem, you get to a good, you get to a good place. Okay? All right. So I want to share with you one Mimer Chazal about Matan Torah. Uh, well, first of all, let me, let, me say, let me say one comment about the Ten Commandments. Uh, two comments about the Ten Commandments, just two very quick comments. First, what is the first commandment of the Ten Commandments? So it says, I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt from the house of slavery. Now, the question is very simple. Question number one is, if God is stating that we owe him obedience because he took us out of Egypt, why doesn't he make a bigger claim? I am the God who created heaven and earth. Why does he just say I took you out of Egypt? He should have said, I am the God who created heaven and earth. So there are three answers to that question. Question number one is, uh, I'm sorry, answer number one is that heaven and earth would be a claim that's equal to Jews and non-Jews. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Everyone owes God obedience because he created heaven and earth. But in the Ten Commandments, God wants to state the unique claim he has on Am Yisrael so he has to pick a unique claim that I took the Jewish people out of slavery. That's answer number one. Answer number two. God says I created heaven and earth while nobody was around then. Even Adam wasn't created until the sixth day. So that's less vivid. But to the people who are hearing the Ten Commandments, every one of them was in Mitzrayim. So God wants to pick an experience that they personally went through, because that's going to be much more powerful. That's answer number two. 
Answer number three is given by the Ramban. And he says the following. There are people and there are philosophies that believe that God is the architect of nature and God is the creator of heaven and earth. But once he created it, it becomes a self-perpetuating, it's called the watchmaker analogy, right? I make a watch. The watch keeps on ticking with me or without me, right? The watchmaker could be long dead and the watch keeps on going. There is a view of God as kind of the architect of the laws of nature, but God is not involved as an active force in either nature nor certainly in human affairs. Right? God doesn't care about what I do, what I don't do. God has better things to do with his time than worry. I remember many years ago, I was giving a, a shear uh, to beginners, and maybe I chose the wrong topic. Uh, we were talking about the laws of Tisha B'Av, and on Tisha B'Av, you're not allowed to wash your whole hands. You only have to, in the morning, you can only wash your hands up to the knuckle. And I was discussing the details of that. So a woman was kind of indignant, and she said, do you mean the infinite, omnipotent God cares if a drop of water goes below my knuckle or above my knuckle? Do you think that makes a difference to God? Now, what is essentially her argument? That, you know, God is the creator of heaven and earth, but God is not involved in what I do, what I don't do. This was a common belief in the ancient world. And uh, this was a belief, actually, it's called deism. De or deism. D-E-I-S-I-M. Deism. Uh, this was the religion, for example, of Thomas Jefferson. And it was the religion of Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein who was Jewish, but, but not observant. Albert Einstein absolutely believed in God. He saw in the wisdom of the universe, the complexity of the universe, that there must be an order, and an order presupposes a creator. Things could not be random or chaotic. He absolutely believed that there was an intelligence behind nature. Okay, no question. He had a deep belief in Hashem. But what he didn't believe is, he didn't believe in what we call a personal God. He didn't believe that God cares about human virtue and human behavior. So essentially, he believed in God, but did not believe in the concept of Torah. He did not believe that God cares if I put on tefillin or keep kosher or keep Shabbos or lie or cheat or steal. God creates nature. And then people do whatever they want to do. There's no particular... Again, not that he was immoral. Einstein actually happened to have a highly developed sense of morality, but he did not believe it, it you know, was because of God's commandments. So the Ramban says, if God would have simply said, I created heaven and earth, that just says he's the architect of nature. But I don't yet see that he cares about human behavior. But by emphasizing the exodus, God is saying there's a principle that evil is something abhorrent to God, like God punishes the Egyptians. God chooses virtue. In other words, it teaches me not only God as creator, but God as intervener in human affairs and human history. And that's very, very fundamental. What you might call is not just the God of nature, but the God of history, the God who intervenes and cares about what human beings do, right? So those are three reasons why the Ten Commandments begins with the invocation of Yitziat Mitzrayim. But now, let's ask another question about the Ten Commandments, and that is, in what way is this a commandment? Now, commandments are when God says, thou shalt do something. That's called mitzvah sase, positive commandment. Or God says, thou shalt not do something, which is called a negative commandment, a mitzvah slo sase. Do it or don't do it. Those are called commandments. I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt. It's not a commandment. What is God telling you to do or not to do? It is not a mitzvah. In what way can it be called a mitzvah? So the Rambam says, Maimonides says, implicit in this statement is a mitzvah to believe in God. 
there is a mitzvah, a commandment to believe in the one God who took you out of Mitzrayim. This is the mitzvah of Amuna. Amuna is a mitzvah. This is what Rambam says, a mitzvah of Amuna Bashem. Ramban, that's Nachmanides, asks a tremendous question. How can there be a commandment to believe in God? If I already believe in God, I don't need a commandment. If I don't believe in God, in what way would the commandment obligate me? <laughs> God commands me to believe in him. But I don't believe there's any God giving me the commandment. It's like having an atheist. You know, someone says, I don't believe in God, or an agnostic. You can't prove there's a God. And I say, no, 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 you must believe in God. And the guy says, why? He says, because God says you have to believe in him. What type of argument is that? Uh, I, he thinks there's no God. Meaning Ramban argues that it's not shayach, it's not possible to have a mitzvah until you believe in Hashem. Once I believe in God, and I believe there's a God out there, then I can say God commands me to do this, 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 and I have to obey. But I can't be commanded to believe in God. So because of this, Ramban argues with Rambam, and Ramban says, Emuna is not a mitzvah. Emuna is a foundational principle that makes all other mitzvahs obligations on you. But it's a foundation. It's not a mitzvah per se. Now, the emesis, the Ramban's argument is a very, very logically compelling argument. But there is a clear textual proof to Maimonides' position, Rambam's position. And that is a famous Gemara in Makos, where the Gemara in Makos tells us that there's a total of 613 commandments in the Torah. 613, and of them, you, you should know the number breakdown, 248 are positive commandments, and they correspond to your bones. You have 248 bones. Each mitzvah gives life to one of your bones. And then we have 365 negative commandments, uh, which correspond to the sinews and ligaments of your body. And when you violate a negative, somehow you're affecting a ligament. Now, we don't really have a matchup, like which mitzvah matches up to what. There actually are some later svarim that try to do matchups, but uh, they're speculative. There's no real makar in chazal. Now, and the Gemara then says, what is the source for 613? It's the verse that says, Torah Siva Lanu Moshe. Moshe gave us a Torah. So let's take the gematria of the word Torah. Tough is 400. Vav is 6, 406. Resh is 200. So that's 606. Hey is 5, is 611. So the Gemara asks, Close but no cigar. You tell me 613. Torah is only 611. So the Gemara's answer is, ah, Moshe gave us 611. But two commandments we heard directly from God. And then we got scared and we asked Moshe to be the intermediary. Which two did we hear from God? The first two commandments of the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt. Thou shalt not have any other gods besides me. So, the Pasuk is great. Moshe gave us Torah, 611. Two, we heard from God. This is a Gemara in Maseches Makos. But what do you see from the Gemara in Makos? The Gemara in Makos says, Befeirush, I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt, is counted as one of the mitzvahs. So that's a... So although Ramban has a very logical question on Maimonides, but the Rambam has a very good textual proof from the Gemara in Maseches Makos. So the question is, how would the Rambam answer Ramban's logical question? Rambam says there is a mitzvah called believing in God. Ramban asks... How can there be a mitzvah to believe in God? If I don't believe in God, then who's commanding me? 
So how will the Rambam answer it? So the answer is this. The mitzvah to believe in God obviously cannot be directed to a person who doesn't believe in God because he has no one to obligate himself. It's directed to somebody who believes in God. But if he believes in God, what does he need a mitzvah for? So the answer is this. A person might have a belief in God because that's the way he was raised. That was his tradition. That was his family environment, etc. So what God is saying is, you who believe in God because of tradition, you're obligated to intellectually examine the philosophical foundations of the existence of God so you can graduate from the blind faith of tradition to a philosophical commitment to truth. Which means, according to Rambam, according to Rambam, the mitzvah of Amunah requires that you philosophically persuade yourself of the existence of God based on logic and not simply based on tradition. Which is part of why Maimonides in particular is very well known for emphasizing the philosophical foundations of faith. So I just want to point out, again, this is a, really a talk for uh, much more than a single shear, that this is a huge, huge machlokas throughout Jewish history. Should we encourage the philosophical exploration of God's existence? Which Maimonides clearly would encourage. Or lehepech, do we discourage it? as something negative and destructive. There are those who actually say that what you might call blind faith, actually blind faith is a misnomer because no, nobody really advocates blind faith. I mean, there are plenty of reasons to believe in God, but the notion of blind faith, I'm just using it in contradistinction to philosophically intricate and detailed analysis. That many were against that idea because here's the problem. If you tell a person to philosophically investigate the arguments for God, then how do you know where they're going to come out? You can't tell a person, you know, philosophically investigate and come out here. Once you're opening up something, they could move in opposite directions. So many historically, many gedolim have, have taken the view that it is better not to open questions of faith up simply because we never know. It's like a Pandora's box, quite literally. You open a Pandora's box, and that can lead people astray in many, many ways. Now, so just to give you a practical example, so if you go to, let's say, a mainstream yeshiva, you go to Mir, you go to Panovich, you go to Chevron, they're not going to offer classes in proofs for the existence of God because they don't want to open it up. Now, how come in Or Sameach, you know, uh, Rabbi Gottlieb, other people talk about this? Because our student body has already been tainted. Once you know Richard Dawkins, and once you know Christopher Hitchens, and once you know Sam Harris, and you've taken the poison, so Nebuch, we got to try to give you the antidote to the poison. But in many, many ways, there were those who took the position it would have been better not to open the box in the first place. So I'm not, I'm not here to decide this one way or the other. I, I'm just here to be a journalist, a halachic journalist, that throughout Jewish history, there have been two different views about the role of philosophy in the enhancement of my relationship to God. According to the Rambam, a philosophical exploration of faith issues is fundamental to Judaism. And it's actually the mitzvah of Amuna. Seek to ground your faith in God on an intellectual basis. And that is exactly what the mitzvah of Amuna is. According to others, there was actually an, a discouraging. Now, now, obviously, Judaism is very intellectual, but, but you understand what I mean. When you learn Gomorrah, so, of course, you're going into all sorts of intricacies. It's very, very intellectual. But it's intellectual within a framework that is unquestioned. Meaning to say, when I'm learning Gomorrah, and I try to get into the arguments pro and con, 
at least within Gemara, you don't say, well, how do I know God said this? You know, that, you know if, in the mainstream, again, maybe in our Smech people bring it up too, but if, if you're in Mir, and the Rebbe's talking about the Ramban and Tosvos, and it's very intricate and very intellectual, and you say, how do I know this comes from God? At best, they will look at you like, uh, in a very, like you're very bizarre, and at worst, they'll just kick you out. So, it's an interesting paradox. Again, I'm really just reflecting out loud. Meaning, on one hand, you're dealing with a very intellectual, analytical study, but certain assumptions are made which are not supposed to be intellectually challenged. Faith in God, belief in Torah, etc. So, Rambam was a great advocate of philosophical speculation. Many, many others uh, were actually against it because of the dangers of the Pandora's box. And um, I'll give you an interesting example of this. You know, one of the greatest books of Musser ever written, which were, was before the Rambam even, is Chovas Halavavos. Chovas Halavavos is the immortal classic, Duties of the Heart. Right? So it's a work about introspection, a work about internally serving God, how to develop reverence for God, fear of God, humility, submission. One of the great, very, very hard safer. It's not an easy safer, but it's a great, great safer. It was written in Arabic and later translated into, into Hebrew. And uh, each chapter is called a gate. Now, the first gate is called Shar HaYichud, the portal or the gate of unity, which is a long, long essay proving intellectually the unity, the existence and the unity of God. After that, he talks about how do you serve God in different ways. So, the Vilna Gaon used to say, the Chovas HaLavavas is a very holy book, but you should start from chapter two. Skip chapter one. <laughs> chapter one is not for you. Of course, sometimes you tell the person chapter one is not for you. That's the one they're, they're going to read for sure. But chapter one is not for you. Start with chapter two about gratitude and everything else. So you see on one hand that the author of the Chavos Halavavos was obviously, he wrote chapter one and he thought this was a worthy discussion. By the time of the Vilna Gaon, they moved away from that type of idea. Ad Kedekach, that, you know, there's a beautiful modern Hebrew translation of Chavos Halavavos which makes it much easier to read, because even the Hebrew translation is a medieval translation. It's, it's a little hard. So somebody retranslated the Chavos HaLavavos into modern flowing Hebrew, but he didn't do it for chapter one. Now, he didn't delete chapter one. He kept it in the original translation, and he gave a 50-page anthology of comments why you shouldn't read it. Uh, so, so we have a love-hate relationship with philosophy. It's very, very true. Uh, according to the Rambam, it is so fundamental that it is the very definition of the mitzvah of Emunah. And according to others, the study is so sinful that unless you've already taken the poison of Sam Harris, so you need the antidote, uh, it's better to keep away from it entirely. So I'm just bringing it up so in case you encounter these opposite reactions, uh, be aware that they are rooted in different historical responses to emuna, to faith in God, and, and the like. Uh, Hasidus generally, for example, Hasidus, the Gamre, totally, 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 totally discouraged philosophical exploration of God. They felt that faith has to be experiential. It has to be emotional. Uh, it has to be based on a feeling of connection to God and not necessarily rooted in syllogistic premises. Even Chabad, which is actually a very intellectual Hasidus, that's why it's called Chachma Binadas, Chabad, uh, does not go into ultimate premises, meaning it does not philosophically investigate how we know there's a God, how we know the Torah. It takes that for granted. It then says we try to understand the nature of divinity, but it's not an attempt to prove things in any way. Yeah. I was going to say, how do the two aren't mutually exclusive? You could have both. Yes, yes. Well, the Alter Rebbe indeed uh, taught in Chabad that we need uh, to intellectually understand something in order to feel emotionally connected to it. But he did not 
uh, he did not uh, consider proof of first principles to be desirable, meaning the introspection occurs after the acceptance of basic dogma. You then try to understand the intellectual ramifications of it. Um, okay, but uh, now again, in, in the secular world, or the Christian world, I'd say, uh, this is a, an active debate to this day as well. Uh, there's a professor of uh, religion, I think University of Indiana, his name is Plantinga, I think. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a funny thing. He says that the essence of faith, and he's a professional philosopher, the essence of faith has to lie into intuition. And he says intuition is a source of knowledge as well. We make a mistake when we think that knowledge is only located through the rational processes of logical reasoning. There is a certain intuitive knowledge that actually might be much deeper. For example, when you decide that you're going to marry a certain person, it's not always based on a detailed list of pros and cons. Oh, I got 100 pros and 98 cons, so the pros have it, or vice versa. There's a certain intuitive leap that your heart is pushing you in a certain direction. And he said that's very much true in our connection to God as well. Uh, there's a certain intuition that has to take over. So on one hand, Judaism is not an irrational faith. Judaism has much rationality to it. So we're not telling you jump off a building. But on the other hand, we make a mistake when we think it can be proved like a mathematical theorem. This is the problem of over, over promise, over proof. Meaning, this is a religion that makes sense, but one should not demand a level of proof that goes beyond the proof that we demand in every other decision of life, right? How do I know when I cross the street, with a light or without a light, that the car is gonna stop? I absolutely don't know that. And in Israel, especially, you may not know that. But I make decisions based on rational, reasonable probability, not certainties. How do you know when you get out of bed in the morning and you swing your leg over the bed and you didn't look at the floor, how do you know there is a floor here? Maybe everything collapsed and you're on top of a pillar and when you step over the bed, you're gonna fall 500 feet to your death. Did you look before you stepped out of bed? Often we don't. We just assume that the probabilities are such, you see? And yet, when it comes to Judaism, all of a sudden, what's the proof, what's the proof, what's the proof, what's the proof? We're asking too much from the system. But at the same time, there is logic, there is rationality, that's the thing. But even logic and rationality still need a leap of faith at the same time. So there is a combination of leap of faith and rational understanding. Okay, we'll stop here. Have a wonderful shot. Thank you for listening to this awesome Air production. To find out more and to partner in our mission, please visit ohr.edu.